Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to week 18 in the PMI Friday webinar series. Uh, my name is Rich Seddon, and I'll be uh, facilitating the session today and assisting Dennis, who's your presenter. Um, I'll be manning the Q&A desk, which we'll be using throughout the session. Uh, please do make use of it. Uh, the controls can be found on your uh, control, Zoom control panel. Um, a, a strange request, first of all, before we get underway, um, we will require, if you possibly have one to hand, a standard paperclip. Don't ask me where I found this, but a standard paperclip for use during the webinar. Uh, we promised you some out-of-the-box thinking, and uh, that's part of it. Um, so a couple of other things before I hand over and get underway fully. Um, we are running these sessions every week on a Friday, and this full schedule can be found at pmi.co.uk forward slash webinars. On there, you'll find the uh, September and October schedule, uh, September schedule, and then we're asking you to help us form the October schedule, um, which will, uh, is made up of suggestions that uh, our participants make based on the voice of the customer survey, which you'll receive on Monday. Please, please do uh, ask us, uh, uh, make your suggestions there, and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to incorporate all that feedback into the topics we cover in October. So, Without further ado, we are recording today's session, so you don't need to bother about capturing the images uh, or the voiceover. That'll all be done um, and distributed early next week. It is also made available on the landing page. We're broadcasting live today for the first time on LinkedIn. Um, so interesting test for us in terms of creativity. Um, hello, people who are joining us on LinkedIn. So without further ado, uh, just a reminder, please do keep me busy on the Q&A desk and I'll hand over to Dennis, who will be hosting the webinar. Cheers, Dennis, over to you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you for coming to this uh, fantastic webinar this afternoon about out-of-the-box thinking. Hence the, uh, the lovely dotty tie as we're going to do some dotty things today. Um, so we're going to start off with, uh, of course, um, if you want to get in touch with me, there's my email address. Uh, do link in uh, with me if you want to. So uh, what we're going to cover today, um, I'm going to share a very simple formula for innovation with you uh, to set the scene. I'm also going to talk through a method, define, design and deploy. So a process by which to be innovative, uh, some creative thinking tools, uh, a summary and like Rich said, please keep him busy with lots of questions. So we have a Q&A, not just at the end, but also throughout. So we're going to start off with a poll. And the poll is as follows. How creative are you? First of all, not a creative bone in my body. A little bit creative if I have to be. I am actually really quite creative. Or you know what? I am the most creative person I know. Fantastic. I see the live. Just coming, coming through live at the moment. As soon as that's finished, we'll uh, share the results. Should hopefully be on screen for everyone at the moment. Well, it's a two horse race uh, currently between I have, I, I'm a little bit creative uh, if I have to be and I, I am creative. Interestingly, nobody says, you know what, I'm not really creative at all. Fantastic. Okay, just give that a couple more seconds. See most of you responded now and we'll put that up on screen. Okay, so hopefully that should now be visible to you all. Dennis, can you see those? Absolutely. So what we're seeing here is nobody uh, said, I don't have a creative a bone in my body. Um, the majority said a little bit creative if I have to be. I am actually creative, it's done a, a close runner. And there's a, a few people says, you know what? I am really, really creative. Now I tell you what, by the end of the session, you will at least go one, one further. And you know, that's my aim, if not money back, as they say. Um. Is that upwards or backwards, Dennis? <laughs> it will be uh, more creative, Richard. Thank okay. you for that. Cheers. So, yeah. So, uh, great. So, let's see how we get on with this. I'm just going to close this poll now. Um, so, first of all, we'll start with a really simple formula. And the formula is as follows. Innovation equals creative thinking and implementation. Because basically, what is innovation to me? is a successful application of creative thinking to a problem by creating a new product or service which satisfies a customer need. 
And it's quite a comprehensive statement. And I'm going to now go deeper into these two elements of innovation, so creative thinking and implementation, but also how do we link that then to your customer needs and the customer in the broader sense of the world, uh, word and world, internal or external. So creativity to me again, it means it's inventing, it's experimenting, it's growing, it's taking risks, breaking rules, making lots and lots of mistakes and having lots of fun. I'll just come up to point out to one of them, and that's the making mistakes. In terms of making mistakes, of course, make little mistakes. Yeah. Learn lots. So test little, fail little, improve little, but test often, improve often. And that's what it's all about in terms of become comfortable with not getting it right first time, but when you get it right, continue. Richard. We have first question, uh, someone uh, quick uh, off the mark here. Um, so the question is, Dennis, um, in terms of making mistakes, on your point of making mistakes, uh, how do you control that in a corporate environment where risk and management is important? So in my view, risk is important everywhere, whatever you do in life. It's always about managing risk. And I will show you a model later, which you uh, may have come across called PDSA to help you with identifying that. Um, clearly in any environment, you're always going to have stakeholders. And the mantra with me with risk always, do whatever you want to do, as long as you don't hurt yourself or somebody else. And that has to be the key mantra throughout. You then define it operationally, what that means within your corporate environment. Okay, thanks Dennis. So, I read lots of, lots of papers almost every day about new innovations. Yesterday, one was published by LG about a new uh, digital mask with all sorts of purifying you know, things in it. And every single time when you ask people, how did you come up with this? Very often, this is what you hear the people who innovate reply. The most exciting phrase in the science, the one that heralds new discoveries. It's not Eureka, it's, hmm, that's funny. And I tell you what, the number of times that I've, I've been working on processes, either within PMI or with my clients, and you see something unusual, you did something that you didn't quite expect, and you go, hey, that is unusual. The skill there is, from a creative perspective and innovation, to stand still and say, this unusual thing here, can I learn from that? Is that something that's desirable? or something that can give me a new insight in uh, to what we're trying to accomplish. So keep reflecting on your own life. And you went, hmm, that's a bit odd. I think, hey, there may be something I can learn from this. So creative thinking, it's the means by which we create and generate new ideas. And from my experience, and I've been doing this now a very, very long time, it can be taught using a method. So even if you're naturally gifted at creative thinking, I can give you more and more tools and methods and means by which to become even more creative. So clearly, I can't, I've only got like, you know, 40, 50 minutes with you. I could spend the whole week with you talking through every single method in, in isolation. But here's just a few of my favorites. So first of all, the absolute classics, open, silent, structured uh, idea generation, which is very useful in very small teams. We also have our reverse idea generation, which is when you have uh, psychological inertia, hang-ups, people have been there, done it, but they've got great ideas, so how do you extract those? We also have a fantastic set of methods by Edward de Bono called lateral and parallel thinking. Again, fantastic ways of breaking through standard patterns of thinking. The something called functional analysis, again, a really nice diagnostic tool. And then lastly, TRIS. The theory of inventive principle, 1946, um, Russian origins by a chap called Altshuler. And again, a fantastic way of resolving contradictions, contradictions and overcoming uh, challenges. So basically, there's lots of methods, lots of tried and tested ways, 
um, and you choose the one that's right for you. And if it doesn't work, try another one. So on that note, let's go and do a very simple and very quick experiment. I hope you've got your paper clip ready because um, well, I've got a few here. Now, what we're going to do is a very quick challenge. And before we do, can I just check, Richard, do we have another question? Uh, we don't at the moment, no. Uh, I, was, I was just pulling, pulling, joining in with my paper clip. <laughs> Fantastic. But we, do, we do, sorry. We have several questions, but I'm saving them up at the moment. Okay. So what we're going to do is really simple. I'm going to give you one minute. And in that one minute, I want you to come up with as many creative uses for a paper clip as you can think of. So are you ready? I'm starting the music now. Three, two, one, go. Right. Very dramatic. <laughs> we have the means. Huh? So, uh, Richard, how many creative uses for paperclip did you come up with? I, I went for eight and then it's uh, currently sitting on my head as, uh, as a halo. <laughs> Well-deserved halo. Fantastic. So, um, so I'm not going to ask you all uh, how many you came up with. Again, feel free to stick in the chat window. And of course, the wackiest, if you've got a really wacky use for paperclip, stick it in the chat window so Rich can share them. <laughs> Within all levels of decency, please, folks. <laughs> so, yes. So, uh, how many uh, did you... So, we've got eight from Rich. Yeah. So, I uh, tell Nine, you what, seven, 11, 16. Wow. Four. Denise, what were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> right, 16. Fantastic. Now, no matter how many you've just come up with, in the next few minutes, this sounds a bit like a salesman exit. I'm not going <laughs> to give you one. I'm not going to give you 10. I'm going to give you 100 new ideas. I, I, have, I have got the best one, though, which is a wedding ring from Sarah. Oh, Great call, fantastic. Sarah. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. So, what we're going to talk about next is uh, what a friend of mine referred to as the thin blue line. And the reason he's, he's, he mentioned the thin blue line, because he had this blue masking uh, tape that he stuck on the wall. Do you remember when we all met up face to face pre-COVID and we could just do stuff in a, in, a, in, a, in a big room? And what he said is, if you use this blue masking tape, the painter's tape, you will not rip off the, uh, the white paint or whatever else is there. So. The thin blue line, that's where it came from. Now, chances are some of the ideas you've just come up with are concept ideas, and some of them are actionable ideas. Now, when it, I'm going to talk to you a bit more about this, but before I do that, I'm going to introduce you, of course, the classic rules for idea generation. First, first of all, no idea is a bad idea. As a matter of fact, the weirder, the better. Secondly, quantity, not quality, at these early stages. The more ideas you've got, the better. No criticism is allowed of any idea. Because what you do not want to do is stifle people's creativity. The only questions you are allowed to ask, however, are for clarification. You know this thing you just wrote down? So Richard's tiara. What did you mean by tiara? Just so I understand the language that you've used to describe it. For clarity, no. Dennis, that was a halo, not a tiara. Come oh, on. was the halo, right. Yeah. So, so and therefore, the top tip, make sure that whenever you write something on that post-it, be it digital or physical, 
and uh, we, we do use lots of digital technology uh, these days. Make sure this is as descriptive as possible. So, as you of course would expect from us, here you go, we have a process for the thin blue line. So of course, you just spoke about generating ideas up with the paper clip, you stick them on the whiteboard, virtual or physical, and then you check for the meaning, the understanding of the words. What you then do, you're going to write a letter on each of the post-its, A, B, C. Now A means it's an actionable idea, C means concept, and B means unsure. Now my operational definition of an actionable idea is it's something specific, something you can do right now. So Richard says I can turn this into a halo or wedding ring, I can just twist it around my finger or stick it on my head and it's done. You may also have some ideas which you call, these are concept ideas, they're slightly broader. They may also be unpractical, unethical, even immoral. And therefore they will take time to develop and convert into an actionable idea. And then the last one is, I'm actually not sure this thing I've just come up with, if it's either an actionable idea or a concept idea. So what we're going to do next, therefore, we stick the ABC on top of the post-it, as you just see here. And then what we're going to draw is the line, the thin blue line. Above the line, the actionable ideas. Now here's the trick. Whatever you now decide it was a B or a C, so unsure or concept goes below the line. And then you lay out the post-its in such a way that they do not overlap. Now here you see the first three. I'm sure that you had some of those similar when you did the creative thinking. Earring, lock, pick, jewelry. Now I've decided, and again, there's no right or wrong here. Earring, I made an actionable idea. I can actually stick this straight into my ear. If I had, of course, a piercing, or I'm not going to draw blood right now. Um, a lock pick. A lock pick, I said, you know what? Lock pick could be, I'm not sure if that's actionable concept, so I'll stick it below the line. But jewelry is definitely concept because jewelry can be so many different things. That means we have empty spaces. What you then do is say, okay, for the earring, what's the concept linked to earring? And you cannot say jewelry anymore. So earring, I can say it's something that pierces. So I, what I'm gonna write down there on the left-hand side is a pierce, piercing device. And now for lockpick, I can go above the line and say, you know what? I'm going to talk about something else here. And lockpick, actually, I always have trouble with my phone and I need to get the SIM card out. So actually, it's a way of removing my SIM card. So we're going to develop this further. And here are, therefore, some of the answers. So jewelry, of course. Jewelry, broad concept, but specifically is a necklace. And in true Blue Peter style, here's one I made earlier. Yeah, so we can put it around, around your neck and therefore we have a necklace. Now, but we don't stop there. Now you develop this whole principle further. You make the line even bigger. And again, below the line, all the concepts, above the line, all the uh, actionable ideas, and you create new spaces on either side. And then you say, okay, earring, what's the concept of an earring? I now need to come up with something new. Okay, earring, something that's round, so circular, right. What else can be circular made out of a paper clip? And here we start again. So this is probably my single favorite method for starting with something really, really simple, which is your natural gift for coming up with some ideas and then developing those further using the ABC line or the thin blue line. And here we go. I started to research these things, of course. And there's, of course, you can buy all this stuff on Etsy.com and wherever else. So I'm going to move further now. I now want to share with you three essential components for creativity. And these three essential components, which were adapted from some research I read by a lady called Teresa Amabile in the social psychology of creativity. She spoke about what we need is expertise and knowledge. We need energy and we need a good environment. Now, what did she mean by expertise and knowledge? Not only having creative thinking methods, but actually also understand the voice of your customer. Understand what their true problems are, their challenges, their needs, their desires. 
energy. Use an individual will need some form of energy to become creative. And therefore, the best one to have is what's called intrinsic motivation. A desire to change, a desire to be good, a desire to do something different and better. And then in terms of the good environment, there's two elements to that, which I'll share with you today. First of all, the physical environment within which we operate. And secondly, a supporting environment. So the people around you, and I'll come back to the first question about um, who said, what about my corporate environment in terms of risk? You need to make sure, sure and understand the environment within which you can operate and be innovative within your own organization. So those are three key dimensions. Now, why is it adapted? PDSA in the middle. We test small, we risk small, and we learn. And we evolve our thinking in a way that we minimize harm to ourselves and to others. So, I'm going to ask you a question. Where do you do your best thinking? Now, Rich knows where I do my best thinking, um, which is in a small room in the house, the bathroom, because it's one of the rooms in the house where it's the least distraction. You may also have at your place of work one of these lovely, lovely creative rooms. And I, I visited Google in Denmark a few years ago, and indeed it was there green, it was full of little toys, etc. It was a playful and actually joyful environment. But you may say, actually, you know what? I do my best thinking in the shower, I do it when I'm walking the dog, I do it when driving, I go for a run. And the key trick here for me is. If you need to be creative and come up with a new idea for your work or for any challenge, go and find that space, that physical environment where you know you can be creative. But one word of warning, switch these things off. So don't go to the toilet with your mobile phone. Yeah, Under the shower, don't have a waterproof phone. Switch the music off. So basically, get rid of all the noise around you so you can focus on the processing of thinking in your head. This is one that actually dawned on me the other day, even though I've been telling this story for many, many years, but I just got confirmed that actually it was with Richard. As a matter of fact, it was yesterday. Yesterday, I was presenting something to Richard to do with a challenge we've got. and. What I found fascinating, Richard had one look at this, 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 this thing, this challenge I had, and he said, well, why don't you do it different? And what I loved about that was, is this, you know, I'll just quote it to you, the voyage of discovery is not in seeking new landscape, but having new eyes. And that means that we need to generate a skill in ourselves or with our teams to have those new eyes, those new lenses to look at the problem to look at the world around us within the organization and of course far wider towards our suppliers and our customers so create a time and place to be creative now i haven't spoken about time yet but a question to you all have a look at your diary not right now by the way but afterwards have a look at your weekly diary is there any time in your diary where you say you know what do not disturb I'm going for a walk or to the pub, but I'm being creative. So plan that time into your diary. And I guarantee you, if you plan a time in your diary and you go to that place where you can be creative, which for me, sometimes I come out of this office and I just go for a walk down to the corner shop on that journey, I will be processing some thinking. So plan that time in your diary. Find a space that works well for you. We've spoken about that. Minimize distractions and therefore encourage your mind to focus on the problem in hand. Now, innovation, of course, it demands a process. It demands a method and a culture now for successfully testing and implementing those creative ideas. So just having good ideas is not good enough in isolation. And I remember a long time ago, I had lots and lots of creative ideas in a previous life, and every single one got shot down time and time and time again. And I got disillusioned. And what I realized was that in that organization, we did not have that su su successful environment 
for the testing and the implementation of creative ideas. The culture just wasn't there. So we're going to go to the next poll here. And in the next poll, I would love to hear from you. How would you describe your culture for innovation at your place of work? And again, four options. We do not encourage innovation at work. It's just not part of our DNA. Or we have only a small group of specialists, say in R&D, that innovate at work. I'm not really sure. Or do you say, actually, everybody's encouraged to innovate at my place at work? Not so just hopefully that's on, Sorry, Dennis. Hopefully that's on screen for everyone now. I can see people are interacting with it. Okay, so we've got uh, everybody is encouraged to innovate. Uh, streets ahead at the moment. Let's give that a few more uh, moments to, for everyone to respond. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, Great, okay, so I'll end that and share the results. Hopefully everyone can see that. Dennis, you'd like to talk us through those? Okay, so thank you. Again, I'm, I'm so encouraged that the majority of you say, you know what, we are all encouraged to innovate at our place of work. Um, followed by, uh, unsurprisingly, a small group of specialists. So again, uh, I'll, I'll give some more answers to that. And then we have two each in we do not encourage innovation at work, and I'm not really sure. So first of all, uh, you know, well done on, to those organizations where you feel you're very comfortable in the innovation uh, culture. And so the one question I would have for you, do you have a described method for that? Uh, which I will share you later on in methods for that. Um, the small group specialist in innovative work. Now, clearly, from my experience, and I was part initially of a small group of specialists. But what I had to learn since, and what I have learned since, because of all the other jobs I've done, either myself or helping other clients, everybody ought to be a part of innovation. I mean, one classic misnomer is when people talk about, you know, some of the large or successful Japanese companies, oh, they only do it in the production facilities. But when you go and dig deeper and you talk to the people in the offices, the people in logistics, the people in supply chain, say, no, no, we are all encouraged to be innovative. Now, clearly, the two people say we do not encourage innovation at work. Then, I mean, I would love to hear from you. And by the way, get in touch afterwards. Say, actually, Dennis, can, can we just talk this through with you here? Because where do we start? But the key message I would give to, to the people saying we do not encourage innovation at work is start small, start little, try it out. But if you want some help, get in touch. Dennis, just before you move off that slide, a really great point raised in the chat here by Jonathan, um, and I'd like your commentary on it. Um, everyone might be encouraged, but the reality is that not everyone does. Yes. Now, uh, Jonathan, uh, fantastic having you on here, mate. Um, I'm not sure what it's like in, in your organization, but what I'll be looking for, of course, is that just the fact that people say yes, and may even be in your values, mightn't it? Huh? We are innovative. The question always is, and I'll come back to that in a minute. You'll see it on one of the slides coming up. Great. By which method? By which method do we encourage people to be creative? By which method do we innovate? Because if you don't have a method for creative thinking, and you may all very well remember in a previous life, we had a really good share scheme for innovation. But in terms of landing the ideas, it just did not happen because the culture wasn't there. The methods were not there. So I hope that answers your, your question, Jonathan. Uh, if Thanks, not, Dennis. I'll come back to that. So in terms of enable us, let's go a little bit further to enable us. Now, I don't know about you, but um, you may have noticed something happened about five months ago, at least here in the western part of the world, depending on which part of the world you are, are in right now. So how about a crisis? Absolutely, a crisis can lead to innovation. Uh, necessity being the mother of all inventions. But actually, what's far more important, and this is an interesting one, in crises, we often firefight. So what you want to look for within your own organization is have stable processes. 
the processes, the everyday management of the everyday stuff that you do as an organization. If you don't have to firefight, that means you have time spare. And that time spare you can then use to learn and grow. And I'll come back to that. Creating time to think and test, what I call tinker time. Now, I used to work in, um, in, my, in my illustrious past for a company called Philips in Holland. And Philips in Holland had something called the physics lab, NAT lab. And in the NAT lab, people were encouraged every Friday afternoon, small budget, go and tinker, go and learn, go and develop, go and play. And some people would go and get courses with the money they were given. Some people would buy some new equipment and they would tinker. Now, out of this tinker time, out of this learning, they would then develop new projects new products or services. These things very often because of the, the type of people that were employed there, we would then create patents. The patents we would sell, the money from the patents would then be the revenue by which we could do the whole year worth of, of creating new things. So what I learned from, from that, that part of my life is by creating time to think and test and tinker, you will come up with new innovations that will be very valuable to your organization and therefore also for you as an individual. Next point, understand the voice of the customer. I can't stress it enough. Unless you are a brand new startup company, then of course you're creating a new product service without there being a demand from a customer because the customer doesn't know yet that they need your product or service. And of course, there's a very exciting part to be in and again, I've been fortunate enough to have been part uh, within PMI, but also within other organizations of that, create something new, which therefore means you create customer demand. But once you're in a mature organization, an established organization, of course, back to a quote by Peter Drucker, it's then the customer that defines what your business is all about. And that means from your perspective, you need to be able to listen compassionately and empathetically to the voice of your customer and truly understand when they say something what they mean by those words so those filters that you have you have to get rid of them the the, the colored glasses you have to get rid of them and listen completely open and cleanly and then search and say what did you mean by what you've just shared with us the outside view an enabler for creative thinking and innovations have someone from the outside coming in. And it could be as simple as your mother, your grandmother, it could be a friend, it could be a colleague, it could be anybody else. But you share your view with, they go, hey, how about this? And that leads me to the final point. I assume the majority of you are working in some form of team. Verbalize your thinking, share your thinking even on paper or in a sketch on a whiteboard. And it can be again digital, using Miro, Ideaflip, Office Whiteboard, or you name it, whatever collaboration tool you've got. That, ha that does two things. One, you hear yourself think. And that can lead then to clarification around the problem. But secondly, the other person again sits there and goes, what are you fraffling on about, mate? I don't understand it. Or they say, actually, I know how to help you here. So sharing with somebody else. Therefore, on the downside, just a few barriers, disruption. Especially, of course, during COVID, we've seen lots of disruption of normal standard business processes. And therefore, they can get away of disruption because you have to firefight. The firefighting, of course, is linked on the left-hand side to not having stable processes. And therefore, we have to stem the causes of problems. But of course, that may not mean I may not uh, result that we actually stand the root causes of the problems. And that's where we want to go down to. You may have mental overload. I don't know about you, but there's been quite an intense period over the last number of months dealing with how do we change the business models. And the last thing I want to share with you is what I call the entrepreneurship myth. Um, so within my professional life, I also coach a number of entrepreneurs um, and I've also been in a number of organizations where they have entrepreneurship as one of the core values in the organization. And I love it. I absolutely love it. But every single time I ask some questions and the same questions. 
when you say entrepreneurship, what do you mean? And very often the answer I get from the, let's call them the bad entrepreneurs who don't understand entrepreneurship is, well, I just go and do anything. We let our people do anything they want. And I'd say, well, hang on a minute. You have one process for doing this in a large organization. Are you telling me that everybody can do that process in different ways? And they go, yeah. So I guarantee you that you have firefighting. And firefighting means mental overload, disruption. You do not actually give them time to think and test and come up with profound improvements. Like I say, I also mentor some successful entrepreneurs. And when I talk to them, is they give me the same story. They have a method for being innovative. But one thing they all share in common, and that's the one thing that I would like to stress to all of you here is, they do adopt, adapt, abandon of ideas very, very rapidly. Because they test really, really small. And because they all test small, and it can even be a day, it can be five minutes, they tried something. If it doesn't quite work, they try something else. So they do this review cycle, PDSA, very, very quickly. And that's what we notice inside PMI as well. Our ability to go far faster at coming up with new products and services. Politics, of course, and I'm not going to talk too much about politics within the organization and bureaucracy, again, can be barriers towards innovation. So here is a model, uh, it's called a system of farm knowledge. It came from a gentleman called William Edwards Deming. And he said here are four lenses to look at any given problem. Now I've taken these lenses and I've adapted them to work towards innovation. So here's some of the filters of innovation applied through the lenses of, of, these, uh, of the system of farm knowledge. So first of all, systems thinking. Like I say, the system is the bigger picture. It's what sits around you. So understand the force of the customer. Define a clear aim, not a solution, by the way. Define the aim. Consider your own team, but also the bigger picture. The impact outside the company and also the environment. And you can be part of that. Create the environment that promotes creativity. Now, variation or variety, they can all lead to ideas. If something unusual happens within your data, within your ways of working, you go, hmm, that's interesting. Can I learn from this? Can I keep it? And even if it's bad, what can I learn from it? So what can I do different? Stability to innovate is key in organizations. That time to stand and stare, to just figure out what's going on here. And for that, of course, you can use all your senses, not just your eyes, your ears, your nose, what do you feel, uh, etc. There's also something around variation which is called convergent and divergent thinking. So broadening it out and then splitting it up. And I can talk to you more about that another time. Theory of knowledge, some models, PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act, or you may be familiar with Plan, Do, Check, Act. All same thing, just slightly different interpretations. Structured idea generation techniques, parallel thinking, lateral thinking, trace, you name it. Lots of models. And lastly, psychology. You may suffer in the organization something called psychological inertia. Now, what I mean by that is there's a limitation to how much we do. The not invented hair syndrome. Cherish the geeks. Now, what I mean by that, you got anybody geeky at work or you may be the geek at work cherish them recognize the value that you can add to different ways of thinking and therefore breaking through existing patterns resistance to change of course always challenge ideas something called a provocation uh, or po uh, um, the boner called had a short letter called po for that and also in your team always have some variety of people well because they have different views of the world they have different backgrounds different experiences and therefore will come up with different ideas Rich. Uh, Dennis, we've got a question here that uh, is relevant to one of the points you just made. Um, now, in terms of the question is, what are your tips for, uh, for work that work well uh, to be creative when you're overwhelmed by work? Okay, a couple of points. First of all, um, if you're overwhelmed by work right now, create a microcosmos. 
create a micro amount of time for you to get away from the overwhelming of work. And it could even be five minutes. So after this webinar, stand up, leave your desk, go for a short walk. So change the scenery, start with that. Number two, make a very small list of the things which are your pain points right now. What's getting in my way? Back to that overwhelming of work. And then categorize them. Categorize them into urgent and important, non-urgent, non-important. So get some kind of priority with that. And then see if you can land some of those. So I think that's what I would start with. Create a microcosmos, which is a different space, a different environment, a different small amount of time. And secondly, get some list of things that trouble you. Cool. Thanks, Dennis. I'm actually just related to that point on a very practical level. We've got a comment from Sarah. She of wedding ring fame from earlier on. Um, Sarah uh, reminded us that uh, you can use uh, the insights functionality on uh, in Outlook, Microsoft Outlook, uh, to book focus time, as Microsoft call it, automatically. So if your organization hasn't got that enabled, uh, it's well worth it. I find it personally a very useful tool. Uh, it can be found up on the top right toolbar um, in terms of insights and it calls it focus time, which is, I find the breakdown of, uh, of time very interesting, mm. specifically related to Dennis's point of making time, as he says, to stand and stare. It's the thinking time and the space that's yeah. so difficult to make these days. Well, that's what I start off with. Now, uh, once you've done that, do the uh, person ask the question, we could then talk about methods, then fill that time in different ways. But if you get an idea, just think about, is it an actual idea or concept idea I've got, and then how do I develop it further? So, to paraphrase Deming, we can all be innovative, we can all be creative, and it comes back to, to what you said, and actually I'm gonna give you another answer now, by which method shall we innovate? So, my three Ds, define, design, and deploy. Define means, understand the voice of the customer, defining the problem and then analyzing the problem thoroughly, break it down into bite-sized components. And back to the feeling overwhelmed by work, compartmentalize bits, break it down into small chunks and say, okay, what can I realistically do in the next hour? What can I realistically test in the next hour? Start with that. Then use of course structured thinking methods for generating ideas. And then test with different options using PDSA, because what you then want to do is to create that, uh, turn the idea, convert it, of course, into an innovation that becomes value add to the organization. And I'm sure if you now listen to this webinar, if you listen to Mary Claire and Warren and some of the other uh, people in my organization, you recognize some of the words that I've used here. They use the same words. So there's a red thread here. And then, of course, the last thing to do is review your learning. What did I learn? from this walk, from this hour. Now, there is another poll here, Rich. Uh, is that uh, correct? Yes, apologies, I was on mute there. <laughs> Excellent. So clearly, we've all gone through COVID-19, and uh, the question I want to check with all of you, of course, has COVID changed anything for your work? So three questions there, not very much, somewhat, a lot. Yeah. Tyron thing, actually interesting. All three at the moment uh, competing with each other are equal parts, roughly. Um, just get your, get your votes in there and we'll see what comes out. Let's give that a few more moments. How interesting. Okay, it's almost neck and neck. Wow. All three, that is not what I was expecting. <laughs> That's brilliant. She's known as in, influencing democracy and uh, uh, commenting on it as, as people are still voting. <laughs> And of course, paraphrasing Isaac Asimov going, hmm, that's it. <laughs> I learn here. That's the <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay, cool. I'll end that now. Uh, just give that two more seconds and we are done. I'll share that with you. Okay, thank you guys. So uh, a lot, uh, that's fantastic to hear, of course. So, um, and I think, uh, you know, clearly, I wish I, I could hear some of your things here. I assume it's because you have had a crisis, you had to change your business models. You had to change your work. And even the PMI, we had to change things. Even though I've been doing this remote working 
for nearly the last 14 years, as long as I've worked for PMI, clearly the last five, six months, it has accelerated and everything has gone, or basically almost everything, 95% of my work has gone to virtual delivery wherever my clients in the world have been. Now, I'd be really interested to know in terms of not very much, what is driving that? So if you can add in the chat window, the people said not very much, I'd be lovely to hear why has not anything changed? Your ability to be innovative. Um, you know, was it general reason? Or we were innovative anyway, so that hasn't changed. Uh, or was there something else getting in the way? So thank you for that little poll here. So what I want to change, uh, add to you now is uh, two examples uh, from within PMI. So like I said, we had a complete change in our ways of working with our customers from face to face, whatever in the world, from up in beautiful Yorkshire down to lovely Devon, uh, Tanzania, Dubai, or even further afield. And of course, now, of course, we are not face to face. So one of the things that we've changed since is to come up with a method by which we could do what we call process confirmation. And instead of doing it face to face, instead of doing it with, with boards on the wall, uh, we created a digital platform for that, which sits now on your smartphone. I tap it in, so I've got a performance genius. You see the icon there. And I can do every day, I can do a self-diagnosis of process confirmation, which then goes through the different levels of the organization, and gets, gets on the dashboard you see in the middle. So we know when to act and when to react to something unusual. A second example I use um, is one of our flagship products um, where we use simulations to teach thinking around change, it was called Orbit. We used to do desktop, physical, in the room where you whack bits of things across the table. And now of course we had to do a virtual version of this so in a very small amount of time, we had a rapid innovation cycle where we've come up with a digital delivery mechanism, um, which uh, we've tested now a number of times with different clients and the response is overwhelmingly positive. So going from the physical to the virtual, we lost little uh, of the, the learning and the quality of learning and the insight. So that's fantastic. So where do you start innovating? Give the customer a really good listening to. And then decide, okay, should I go into the supply chain? So in my suppliers, the inputs, materials, the machines I use, the methods by which we operate, the environment, outputs, or the delivery mechanisms. Now, you know, like you saw on the previous page, we still work with companies in terms of simulations, in terms of helping them through uh, daily process confirmation. We've just changed the delivery mechanism. Of course, we help our customers to develop further. So you choose, but it starts with listening. I want to share, share another model with you. On the x-axis, time, and on the y-axis, product maturity. So first of all, you introduce a new product or service to your customer or within your business. You then, of course, grow it in maturity. It then reaches full maturity, and then we get this fourth phase, which is like a, de a decline, declination, decline, because other products or ways of working are starting to take over. So here's an example, for example, that we've got for um, Orbit. It started back in 1997, something called Wacket. Uh, we then combined a number of different elements to make it a single red thread, so it became Orbit Classroom. We've now gone in 2020 to Orbit Virtual. And I know what the next step is going to be. It's going to be about gamification of this in a completely different format and shape. Now, of course, I hope it's going to be sooner rather than later, but it will happen. So the nice thing about understanding the evolution of your challenges at work is there is an evolution, and we can predict, therefore, the evolution, what's going to happen next. There's lots of well-documented, uh, documented, um, uh, publicized work around this, to understand the evolution of products or services. And of course, don't forget the PDSA. So we've reached nearly the end. So in summary, it all starts with the customer, understand the needs and expectations, innovation, the equation, creative thinking plus implementation is key to become innovative. Use that process, define, uh, design, define, deploy. 
Use a method of creative thinking. And last but not least, start by creating time and space to be creative. So on that note, um, I thank you already. And I'll hand over to Richard for any other questions. So we've got quite a few questions, Dennis, on the desk. Uh, one that I've been uh, storing up from earlier on, which I think you've done, uh, you've done quite a lot of uh, detail on, but it's a, it's a great point that he'd made uh, in early doors within the session. Um, and the essence of it is, and I think this is a common perception, that experimenting can be a lengthy process. So yes. how do you manage this with accelerating in innovation in a busy environment? So again, not understanding, uh, of course, your specific challenge. Um, some of the developments I've been party of have been multiple years, multi-million pound uh, experiments. Um, the biggest one I ever contributed to, we had a dedicated, there was tens of millions lab where we did experimentation, experimentations. But every single time we did the same thing because it was all about project management. We broke the problem, the long term experiment down into bite sized chunks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the key thing here is keep it small. Great. Brilliant. Um, so an, another related question, which is a great one, actually. Um, how do we differentiate between innovation slash creativity and continual imp continuous improvement processes? <laughs> Right. So continuous improvements, the means by which you achieve continuous improvement can be by what something's sometimes called evolution or revolution. Huh? So small step change or big step change. And definitely, if you think about the Venn diagram, the words and the meaning of the words can overlap. Um, I think it's, 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 it's about how you choose to interpret them. But to come back to it, I, to, they, they can be one and the same. And I know we have some angels and pinheads discussions here. And if you want to discuss more, buy me a pint in the pub. We'll talk more about it. For the, for the avoidance of doubt, folks, that was angels on pinheads, by the way. And nothing else that it sounded like. Anyway, <laughs> moving swiftly on. Um, go, we, we've got some great, some great comments uh, here coming in. Um, and uh, John, John mentions here that uh, in his business, uh, they had some R&D people traditionally work from home once a week, uh, and they use that time for reading, which I think backs up your point um, earlier on, Dennis, about uh, creating, this, creating the space. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so just time for a, another couple. And uh, as I said earlier on, this is our first time live on LinkedIn. So I've been keeping an eye on the, on the LinkedIn desk as well. And people have been uh, posting questions there too. Um, so we've got, uh, got one here. Um, if people do not see innovation as part of the job, um, how can that be tackled? Right, really interesting. We're going to draw a very small picture here. You know, in this new world, we have now two jobs, I believe. Yeah. The first job is, of course, to do the job. Yeah. That's the first thing that people come to behind. What people now increasingly start to realize that we also have a second part of our job, which is to improve the job. So what I'll be looking for in the people that are employed, but also the people that have been working with me for a long time is to start to recognize that second element. I want you to not just do a good job, but also improve it. And I can go through different mechanisms. So think about if you have a personal development plan or you have targets set for the year, make part of those targets improvement, change, growth, and reading books or you know drawing pictures great thanks dennis um would you uh, do me a favor and move to your next slide please dennis of course i'll just uh, so while dennis is doing that um ladies and gents i'd just like to uh, thank you very much once more for joining us uh, number 18 in the uh, pmi friday webinar series um on screen now is the upcoming schedule for September. Quick reminder for those of you participating uh, in the live event via Zoom, uh, you'll receive a survey on uh, Voice of the Customer survey on Monday morning via our newly automated system. Um, and we please do uh, take the time to fill that in. We really do appreciate it and fill in the topics suggesting that you'd like to see next. And we will build October's schedule accordingly in line with your feedback. So uh, from Dennis and myself, thank you once again for joining us. It's wonderful to have you. Um, have a very happy and safe, relaxing weekend. Thanks all.
So thank you all. And if you've got more questions, uh, find me on LinkedIn or send me an email and I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. Thank you all. Cheers all.